would you like to recruit more volunteers and build a thriving team to reach even more teenagers for Jesus? Today on Student Ministry Connection, we'll talk with Nick Blevins, author of the Volunteer Playbook, about how to better recruit, train, and empower your ministry volunteers. Welcome to Student Ministry Connection, a podcast for those who serve in student ministry, want to connect, and desire to grow. My name is Steve Cullum, and I have served in student ministry for over 20 years. And one thing I've experienced over and over is that I cannot do this alone. If I truly wanted to make an impact on teenagers, I needed to partner with parents, I needed to have a healthy network, and I needed to have a team around me. So it was early in my ministry when I realized this concept. I was also brand new at this church, and I didn't know anyone. How was I supposed to form a team? And I had no idea how I was supposed to train them as well. I was just getting started in ministry myself. Over the years, though, through a lot of trial and error, but also with the instruction of some great mentors, I was able to gain some skills that allowed me to form teams of amazing volunteers. But I still had times where my teams weren't where they needed to be. Recruiting and training is this ongoing task within ministry. So how can you do it well? On this episode, I'm going to be talking with my friend Nick Blevins, the author of The Volunteer Playbook, which just launched today, April 18th, 2023. In fact, be sure to listen all the way to the end of the podcast and check the show notes for details on how you can win a free copy of Nick's book in a contest that we're going to be running until May 2nd, 2023. But before we jump into that conversation, let's pause to thank the sponsor of this episode of the podcast. G-Shades is a youth ministry curriculum and teaching strategy focused on helping students see everyday life situations through the lens of the gospel. G-Shades has options to fit everyone as well, with three plans to choose from. This curriculum gives you the resources that you need to do what you do better. Do you need message outlines, a discussion guide, and a game? That's just $20 a month. If you're looking for a higher production value, including bumper videos, Instagram devotionals, and parent guides, that's $30 a month. And if you want an affordable, engaging video curriculum, G-Shades has you covered for only $40 a month. You will not find a better youth ministry video curriculum at that price point anywhere. Head over to gshades.org, that's G-S-H-A-D-E-S dot O-R-G to download season four of G-Shades curriculum and use the promo code CONNECTION at checkout to receive an extra $20 off your order. G-Shades, seeing life through the lens of the gospel. Thank you, G-Shades, for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. You can find the link to G-Shades in the podcast show notes. Nick and his wife, Jennifer, have been married for nearly two decades, and they have three amazing kids. Nick also serves as a next-gen pastor at Community Christian Church in Baltimore, Maryland, where he oversees their ministry to students, kids, and families. He and Jennifer were a part of the launch team for the church when it started back in 2006. Nick's dream is to help churches reach their full potential, and he seeks to do that by providing resources, coaching, and consulting for church leaders through both nickblevins.com and ministryboost.org. And we're so grateful to have Nick on the podcast today. So welcome to the podcast, Nick. It's great to have you on. I've been fortunate enough to to be a guest on your podcast a couple times, so it's really great to have you on this one. It is. It's coming full circle. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. So I'd love to begin talking about your story. So how did you begin your relationship with Jesus and how did you get your start in ministry? I grew up going to church ever since I was two. Like the way I tell the story is my mom's like, we got to get some Jesus on this crazy two year old. Let's you know, take him to church. And, and she was invited. You know, there's, there's so much power in inviting somebody. So a friend of her invited her to a church and that's the church I attended and grew up in. Uh, I was born in Virginia, but we moved to Maryland when I was two. And it was shortly after that that she started going to this church. And, you know, I've, li- I've lived my my whole life here. I've only been part of two churches my whole life. The one I grew up in and the one that I've worked for that we helped start 17 years ago. Uh, and there's just a great blessing in that. You know, obviously there's, it, the, I love getting to see and work with a lot of churches now because it's just so cool just to see the kingdom of God and how that works. But for me, uh, it's been two churches and I came to faith in that church. I mean, it was a Baptist church and there were probably multiple times when like I could have 
publicly shared that I believed in Jesus, but as somebody who is definitely an introvert and still is, but was really an introvert as a kid, uh, it took all the way to I was about 16 before I was ready to say, okay. Uh, and I've got funny stories too about you know, <laughs> some of those moments along the way. But there was a leader who'd invested in me, who actually knew me, had asked me one time when we were on a youth mission trip, hey, I know, I feel like you believe in Jesus, but you've never taken a step to get baptized and publicly profess your faith. And it was him and invite me to do that. And him, especially him who had known me and invested in me for a couple of years, as opposed to maybe some folks that didn't know me as well. And so that's, you know, that's when I got baptized and, I uh, mean, that's student ministry. My youth pastor, I'm blessed that my, my youth pastor, I'm not a young person. Uh, so it's really fortunate that my youth pastor still lives in my area as a pastor of a church. Mm-hmm. And we have, we have lunch three, four, five times a year. He's still a, a great mentor for me. Uh, he's known my wife. Uh, you know, I, I married the pastor's daughter, by the way. Uh, now we both didn't date till we were out of high school, but so he knew my youth pastor knew both of us since we were like in middle school, you know? So that's just been an awesome blessing to have him in my life. And so much of what I have learned in ministry has come from Jeff uh, and which is just great. Jeff is, it's some, it's great having mentors of all types, but Jeff is one of those people that's just strong where I'm weak. Mm. And so that's just been such a blessing, you know, and he was, and even for my own faith, Jeff was real, you know, like he's definitely a huge part of my faith journey because I got to see what following Jesus really looked like and to be real and authentic with that. And as a teenager, uh, I know now teenagers really have an eye for that, but I think I did too back Mm. then. And so I was very fortunate to be, to grow up in a great church with great leaders, a lot of which actually I could name five, six, seven people I still know today, you know, that live in this area that, you know, were part of that church and part of my life that I'm very thankful for. That's cool. That's, that's awesome. I love, there's so many different youth pastors that I've talked to and people in ministry that I've talked to over the years. And so many of them have gotten their start in it because of a youth pastor playing a big role in their life as well. And that was, that's my story as well. And it's so great to, to see that passed on. Um, and we never know like what the impact that we're going to be able to have as well. And there's probably going to hopefully be, be people that are down the line and in ministry as well. And it's really cool to think that you know, they might tell their story and, and we might be a part of that. And they're like, wow, I had a, yeah. I had a pastor that was pouring into me and that's why I'm where I am today. So, yeah. Really and cool. I didn't even talk about, you know, going into vocational ministry, but cause I never had planned to do that. I went to school for, um, information technology. I had a bachelor's, got a bachelor's in information technology, information management systems from UMBC worked at uh, Northrop Grumman, a huge defense contractor, and always thought I'd be heavily involved in a church volunteering, just like I had done in my church. My wife and I weren't married at that time when like I was in college, and, but then we got married a couple of years later. But even when we were dating, we were, we were volunteering like five roles in a church. Like a lot of the things you probably shouldn't do as a church, my church was doing. Um, and that was making it hard, obviously, for volunteers because you're just doing too many things and all that kind of stuff. But we loved it and we were involved and, and, um, I, but I still never thought I'd work for a church. What we felt like was our area. I live in around Baltimore, Maryland. And we felt like back then, this was 20 years ago, that we need more new churches. Um, I had read Andy Stanley's visioneering book for a different reason. But you read the book, you hear about the beginning of North Point Community Church. And mm-hmm. and all I could leave with after leaving that reading that book was we need more churches like that. Mm-hmm. We need more churches that unchurched people can be invited to that um, would make sense and they would feel welcome connect them to Jesus. And there were churches getting started, you know, all the time. Um, my church had planted six churches in its history, but they hadn't planted one in uh, at least uh, 10 years at that point. And so we were just patient and prayed uh, for like, Hey, what's a church plant that we can go be a part of and we'll volunteer and help. And we heard about one coming eventually and they needed a kid's pastor. And that previous summer, my youth pastor needed a youth pastor and he asked me about it. And for the mm-hmm. first time ever, I thought, I think I would like to do that. But my youth pastor was a pastor of a small um, church that wasn't super traditional, but was kind of traditional. It was very similar to the church I come out of. And so part of me was like, I don't know. Like it's a lot healthier at that time. And and he's awesome. And so many things were great. But like stylistically, part of me was like, no, I want to try to be a part of something a little bit different stylistically mm-hmm. that might, might, I mean, who knows, be better at reaching – this community, or at least the people I knew that I would want to invite to church. And so 
I didn't take, you know, pursue that job with him. But when they, this church that seemed like it was a fit and was going to get started, needed a kids pastor. I was like, eh, mostly volunteered in student ministry, but, uh, you know, we led VBS and an upward sports program for kids. Like there was some experience there in kids ministry and this might be sacrilege to your podcast listeners, but as a next gen pastor, I feel like there's a huge overlap of kids and student ministry. That's the same, like 80%. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot, there's impo- very, very, very important things that are different, but 80% of it is the same. And so I thought I, I might be able to do that. And, you know, here we are 17 years later, you know, I jumped on board the church. It was an answered prayer. It really was what we were praying for, for this area. And our church has actually been a part of helping plant other churches, mostly financially, mm-hmm. but also with some people sending people, sending staff. And, and it's, it's just really cool. I think there's been 18, I think churches planted around the Baltimore DC area wow. uh, since ours. And man, it's just awesome. It's just great. It's, it's like, it's what we prayed for and, yeah. and get to be a part of. So I was just thankful. And that's how that's I, really cool. I kind of, kind of fell into it. And, yeah. You know, I don't know if I felt <laughs> called, but I volunteered. Yeah. <laughs> and God takes it for sure. And uh-huh. so, yeah, you've had lots of experience in ministry, which means you've had a lot of experience working with volunteers. I mean, starting as a volunteer yourself and then, you know, moving into leading volunteers. And so you're about to release this book that's all about that. And uh, before we would jump into the book itself, I'd love to just talk about volunteers. Like, why would you say volunteers are so important to the church? And why should we as leaders grow in the area of recruiting, training and empowering those volunteers? Yeah, I mean, what could you do in a church? And and obviously churches look different, take different shapes. I mean, think of like a house church would be a different kind of thing. But in, like in most U.S. churches and a lot of churches around the world, what would happen in a church if it was just the staff there doing things? Like it, it'd just be awful. Um, like I remember years ago, there's a church that did like a no-show Sunday, tried to like, okay, mm-hmm. let's, what if no volunteers show up as a way to show, you know, what this would be like. Volunteers are the church, the lifeblood of the church and we all know this. I mean, anybody that leads a ministry, it's it's like, you know, if you had all the volunteers you wanted, or if you ever did have that in your life, you remember. And it's like, that was great. And it was functioning well. It gives you more time to pursue other things that are going to be helpful to serving your community and work on things and make things better. And when you're struggling for volunteers, it makes everything worse. It's a scramble. It's like you're, it's like the ship is sinking and you're plugging holes and you're spending so much time plugging holes. You can't actually do what you want to do. And and it's tough because it's it's a huge challenge, one of the biggest needs, and it never unfortunately it never goes away. Like you know, spoiler alert: there's even if you recruit mm-hmm. all the ones you need, things change, and and then you, you're back there again. But it doesn't have to always be a struggle. I think that's the thing that I think is important is le- as leaders, if we can become really good volunteer recruiters and really good leaders of volunteers, you can build this kind of culture where yeah, there'll be ups and downs. There'll be a season where you've got. 95% of the volunteers you need, but then there'll be a season when you only have 75. I mean, COVID was a great example of that. Yeah. And, but, but you'll be able to build it back. You know what I mean? So you won't spend those times where it's just a real struggle would be few and far between, but it isn't easy either. So I, I think it's just important to recognize that it's one of the most important things we do yet. Oftentimes for most of us in church world, it's one of the things that gets the least amount of our time. You know, if you think yeah. about your week, how much time do you spend volunteer recruiting? Uh, most people that I ask that question to say zero or one hours. Um, and I think even the people that are saying one are using pastor math. It's like 0.2, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it was an hour a few weeks ago. Um, and you know, that that's usually not going to work. That's usually not going to work. So I think it's really important to lean in here. And then it's one of those things where it just, it makes everything else better. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely seems like it's, it's one of those things that, that unfortunately falls to the wayside because the, it seems like the, 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 the importance of, of our time, the pri- our priorities usually go to things that are more immediate, um, mm-hmm. not thinking about the idea of we need to build this thing so we can actually go further and maybe go faster eventually. But it's one of those things that it's it's not an immediate thing. Sunday's coming <laughs> sort of idea. Yes. So that's we have to do yes. focus on that a lot more a lot of times. We yeah. do. And that's hard because it is the urgent thing. This one feels terrible when you're doing it and you don't have enough volunteers, but then it's over and you're back. You know what I mean? Like you're back right. planning for the next week or whatever it is. And then the other thing feels, feels more urgent. So, yeah. And yeah. it's harder, you know, it's just like uh, writing a message is hard, you know? So mm-hmm. like if you're preaching in a student ministry every week, that's really hard, but you have more control over it. Like nobody's telling you no, <laughs> you know, with recruiting, you're you know, people are going to turn you down. People are going to say no, yeah. people are going to not reply. And it's just a lot. So there's like rejection there. Um, mm-hmm. So I get it. It's tough. It is hard. 
yeah. but it's not impossible. That's the thing I hope right. people know is like, no, and there, you know, there's a way to do it and, and have a good, healthy volunteer culture. Yeah. And I love that. Like to be able to, to inspire people, equip them and empower them to actually be able to do this. Like some, some people I've met, they're just naturally really good at that. It just recruiting yes. and building a team yeah. is a natural talent, but it doesn't mean if you don't have that natural talent, you can't develop that. And I love that's, that's what your, your book is all about. I love how you've structured it as a playbook, taking some notes from football. Uh, I love the, the five different sections that you cover about recruiting, uh, a recruiting plan that we really need that yeah. plan. We need to build a foundation of vision and culture there. We need to structure our team for growth, empower the team, and also you, ways to be able to boost that recruitment over time. Um, you've even included practical steps that I love uh, having in the book, as well as recommended resources and game-changing strategies. A lot of times I read a book and it's filled with opinions and theory, which is great, but I'm left wondering, okay, what do I actually do with this? And you've kind of taken sure. a step further to actually put that in the book and give us some practical steps after that, which has been awesome. So I would love if we had the time to go into depth in all those different areas, but unless we want to make this episode like a five hour episode, I decided to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. to take the sports metaphor and, and discuss some of the highlights. Um, if you yeah. will, uh, of the books. So first of all, you write about the importance of a five part recruiting framework. So could you go into that quickly and just kind of explain what that's all about? Sure. And you mentioned like the structure of the book. I mean, gosh, one of the things I love to hear feedback on from readers is, was it helpful? Because I wrestled with that because the there's kind of like two things I'm trying to accomplish. One is helping you actually recruit volunteers and, and build and, you know, do that well, because that's the immediate felt need, but then also give you the tools to build a great, healthy volunteer culture. And that takes more time. Some of it's not even fun. <laughs> you know, some of it's more boring. Uh, some of it, you, it's not even as tangible. But like, if you don't want to build a truly great, healthy volunteer culture, and I wrestle with it because part of me is like, I, I wanted to start the book there. Let's start with the mm -hmm. foundation. Let's pour the concrete in the basement or whatever before we start putting the other thing. And that wouldn't be recruiting, right? Because you get to talk about your mission and your vision and things like that. But I just knew if you're using this book, if you're like any any other church leader, it's like that's not urgent. So yep. I'd structure it like let's serve, solve the urgent thing and recruit. That's the yeah. framework we'll talk about. Then maybe we can spend some time on this. And then we'll come at the end and give you some just some like hacks isn't maybe the right term, but those boosts that you mentioned. And, mm -hmm. you know, now you can even supplement. Now that you've built something good and strong and healthy, you can really, you know, pour gas on that fire, so to speak, and make it better. Yeah. But, yeah, I start with a framework. Uh early because I think the recruiting, I mean, that is the, the biggest felt need. And the five-part framework, the way I say it is the biggest reason church leaders don't recruit volunteers is they don't give it enough time, like we talked about, and they don't have a plan. Um, I, most church leaders I talk to well, were never trained how to recruit volunteers. You either like sort of picked it up from whoever worked there before you, maybe your boss, maybe it was taught in college, although I've never experienced that. So if you went to college before some type of vocational ministry degree. And so we wanted to give, uh, I say we, cause it's not just me, you know, my business partner, Kenny Conley is part of creating this with the things we do with ministry boost, a five part framework saying, Hey, take that. You can make it a six part and do your own. You can make it a three part, like you can do whatever you want, but have a framework that you use. So for us, the five parts are think about it, like the steps people take to go from I don't even know about volunteering at your church to I'm placed in a role. So the first step is prospects. And these are people who could serve in your ministry. That's it. That's like literally all it is. It's not, you haven't refined anything. You haven't done a background check. You, you don't even know if they'd be a fit. This is just a list of anyone who could serve in your ministry. So for me, I always say just anybody who isn't currently serving but as a part of your church like that. So most churches have a huge prospect list. Even if your church is 80 people, it on average it's 80, but there's probably 160 that call that church home. You know, maybe you got 80 people serving, but there's another 80 or 40 or whatever that is that they're a part of that church and, and they're not serving their prospects. And you could just put them on a list. And then the second step of the framework is conversation is what we call it. What we really mean is it's in conversation. So if I reach out to a prospect and I may know them or not, it just depends. Once they reply, whether that's an email, a text, a conversation in the lobby, they're now in conversation. They have moved from step one, a prospect who could serve to now we're in conversation, step two. And then step three is orientation. And we kind of try to change the 
the idea of orientation. Like you think of orientation, you might think of like a class that's like an hour and there's going to be some policies and procedures and uh, we're going to go over all those kind of things. And, and, and our approach is no, no, you don't want to do that. Like you got to do that somewhere, but that not here, not for the orientation. The orientation is let's sell them on why this matters. Why should you serve period? But also why should you serve in this ministry or at our church? So anybody there from the conversation, that's anybody who has signed up for the orientation. And an orientation, I just did this a couple of weeks ago, and I'm about to do it again at our church in two weeks, where sometimes we just do volunteer tours. That's what mm-hmm. we call them. They're 20 to 25 minutes. We tell people show up 10, 15 minutes before the service. You'll be done 15 minutes into the service. You could even still go to the service if you want. Now you'll be coming in late, probably during some singing time, but you'll get in there. And it, uh, it worked really well. You know, two weeks ago, we had 40 people come do tours or 35, I think. Um, for, I think like 40 signed up and 35 or something showed up. We'll do it again in two weeks. And so I want people to think about that with orientation a little more than like a class. Not that you can't do the class. We do that too. But this is like vision. That's the word I would associate with it. Like give them vision. And then there's onboarding. That's the fourth step. So they've come to an orientation, whether that's a tour or a class or whatever. They've said yes to serving. So now they're onboarding. And I was surprised years ago working with some church leaders, how many church leaders lose volunteers on this step of the process. Mm. Like in my mind, once you have said yes, 90% of those people should be serving, right? It should be a very small, but I've learned working with other church leaders that sometimes it's not. Sometimes people lose half the number of people that say yes, only half actually make it. And mm. what I would say is something's wrong there. <laughs> like we got to yeah. diagnose that. And then the, the last step is just placed. They're, you know, serving in a role. And obviously there's some things you want to do there to help set them up for success and, and stick out for the long haul. But those are the five steps. And again, the, the five steps aren't magic, but if you can have your own framework, your own steps yeah. and manage it along the way, you'll continue to you know encourage people through that without losing them. I think sometimes mm-hmm. we lose people in the process. Yeah. So, so true. And, and <laughs> like I said earlier, we, we could probably, we could definitely dig into that more for sure. But um, just as a tease, people should read the book. Uh, so I'm going to move on. Um, but I'd love to also hit on this, this other big step that you do focus a lot on the, the foundation for that ministry um, and then the volunteer team. And I remember learning early on, I, I had the privilege of having some incredible mentors and Bible college professors as well that, that also taught me that. And you spend a good chunk of the book talking about that, but this may be a big question, but what is the difference as you're setting up that foundation between mission, vision, strategy, culture, and what should we actually focus on first? Because that's a lot to focus on. Again, the tyranny of the urgent Sunday's coming. We got to build this mm-hmm. foundation. What, what, where should we go? So first of all, what's the difference between all those different things? And then what should we focus on first? Yes. And this is very confusing. I think if you, you know, hear different people talk about it and people interchange these words, churches, I would say certainly are confused about this because they'll have like a, a, a mission that feels like a strategy to me. And I'm not, uh, shoot, I'm definitely not the expert on this, but over the years, I feel like I've, I've got my own, at least the diff- way I differentiate that I'll share with you. And I'd love to hear what everybody thinks. Uh, and this is the stuff I love this stuff. There's like a part of me that's like, I guess some kind of an organizational leadership nerd. Um, and I also, I also love it cause I think it provides clarity and clarity mm-hmm. is what draws people in, right? Like they're more ready to volunteer when they understand why and how and all those things. So mission to me is purpose. I feel like in the church world, this is easy. It's the great commission. Now you can call it something else. Like my church is, says helping people find their way back to God. And, and, and it's obviously that even that you can tell it's not a perfect mission statement cause we're not really talking about discipleship in it and, What if you always follow, you know, or like Mm -hmm. always part of a church? Like, you know, there's, and I think that's fine because I don't think mission statements have to be perfect. I just think as a church and even as a ministry, that part is easier because we've, it's been given to us, you know, by God, we know the purpose. We can reframe it, rephrase it however you want. Vision is, I think where it starts to get really muddy because vision can be so many different things. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think I like, I point to a big picture vision that we're going to put a man on the moon you know, in the sixties, JFK said to have a man on the moon before the decade is out. That was a very clear vision that was even measurable because he talked about what to where by when. So that was a vision that was big picture, but it was also measurable. You could have another vision that was broader. Like if you were NASA and it's just uh, to 
the vision is to explore and learn new things that would help our planet through space or something like that. Like, I don't know, maybe Elon and uh, SpaceX has some kind of vision. I'm not sure. And it would be more like it's less measurable. It'd be more just like general and, and just trying to give you a picture. And then there's even like really what I would call like micro vision. Hey, this is how we do check in for student ministry. <laughs> you know what I mean? And here's why we do it that way, because we want new students to feel like they're just as welcome as existing students. So, you know, whatever. And so the way I would say with vision is, and sometimes in the book, like what I like to use is a road trip analogy. Mission is why we're taking this trip. We're going to Florida. We're driving to Florida with a family to, you know, have a vacation and go to Disney or whatever. And the purpose is it isn't even just to go to Florida. It's to create these lasting memories together mm-hmm. as a family, right? That's the, the mission. Vision would be picking that destination on the map. It's Orlando because we're going to Disney. So I can draw and I can use Google Maps. I can see a map from where I live in Maryland to Florida. I now have the vision. The vision is to get to Disney and have a great experience by whatever this week, you know, that whatever. Mm -hmm. That would be one example of a vision. And in church world, I think you can go either way where you can go like general vision. Um, You know, like in our children's ministry, we have talked about we've borrowed language from Orange and the Phase Project. Sometimes we'll talk about our vision is to give kids a place to belong and a leader who believes in them. And for our leaders, they understand like that's a general vision. It's not just, it's sort of measurable. Like every kid then should have a place and a leader, right? So that there's some measure to that, but it's not, it's not, you know, another vision could be to um, have 500 kids attending on average by 2024 or something like that. Like, so I don't want to like pigeonhole it in. It's got to be one thing, but I think the key is it's a picture of a preferred future. It's Mm -hmm. a point on a map. It, you can say, this is it, you know, this is it. And maybe, you know, I think, um, you know, our church, when we launched our church, we wanted our vision and still is to this day to reach people who are not a part of any church. Okay. Well, you can kind of measure that. And we do, we do a survey every two years to figure out who we're reaching. Are they part of a church or not? But there's no end goal to it. We didn't say to reach a mm-hmm. thousand people or 10,000 yeah. people or whatever. So, and I don't think you have to do one or the other, but that's vision strategy to me is how you, how you're going to get there. So like in the map analogy, are we taking a car? Are we taking a plane? Are we taking a car to get to the plane to get, you know what I mean? Like what's, mm-hmm. what's the plan? And in a map, it's, it's easy to understand in churches. It's a little harder, but I think most people can relate to a, a lot of church strategies. Sometimes they're called mission or vision, but think about like my church is celebrate, connect, contributes the three C's. If we can get somebody to celebrate in services, connect in groups and contribute by serving and contributing with their finances, they'll, and they just keep doing that they'll grow their faith. We will help them find their way back to God. So that's how we're going to do it. And everything we do fits in one of those three C's. Like you can find a place for it to fit within the strategy. I mean, Willow used to have the five things. I don't remember what they are now. Saddleback had the bases or something like, so if you go back, you know, decades ago, churches where North Point had the foyer living room kitchen. I think they've totally changed that Mm -hmm. now. But the idea is in a, it can't be a 27 part plan. You know, what's a two, three, four, maybe five part plan for how we're going to do what we just said we're going to do. And then culture, you asked which one would you do first? It's mm-hmm. it's not the most important, but I actually think culture is the one I would focus on first mm-hmm. because it's the one that people feel. Yeah. Nobody walks in and thinks and feels the mission or the vision or the strategy. They might hear it. Like if you come to my church, you hear helping people find their way back to God every week. But before you've even heard that, you've already got a sense. How's this church feel? Yeah. What's this like? Do I feel welcome here? Are these people fun or are they weird? You know what I mean? Like, you yeah. know, what's this music like? You're like, so all of that is culture. And so I just, def- I just define culture. It's kind of like how we do things here. And like in the map analogy, it's kind of like the guardrails. Like we're not going to get outside of this in our road trip, you know, to where we're going. We're not going to do something that we don't want to do that can endanger us and, you know, cause a crash. And it, and I think how we do things here is probably the best way to define it. And then as a leader, I think it's the most important. So you have to figure out how can we talk about what we want the culture to be mm-hmm. over and over again. So it actually becomes that because every church and every ministry has a culture. It's just, is it on purpose or not? You know what I mean? Yep. And yep. is it good? Is it good and healthy or not? And if you get that right, then people will you know stick, they'll love it, they'll buy in and you'll have more time to talk mm. mission, vision, strategy. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually where my mind was going to is it, I feel like, yeah, if you, if the culture is what's going to draw them in 
and then you can pass on that vision and mission to give them legs to to go the long haul that that really needs to be there both are important but yeah it makes more sense to me to to really focus on that culture uh at the beginning as well so that you can get to the other very important pieces um so after you've built this and everything you talk about the the importance of having a leadership pipeline so how can we use that to help our leaders continue to grow over time yeah, and leadership pipeline, that was like a buzzword in church life, don't you think? You like over the last, I don't know, eight years or something like that. I feel like it's died down a little bit least recently. I still think it's a really important thing. I think there's two aspects to it that I think are important. One is a pipeline can be and should be, I think, kind of the base structure for your volunteer team. So, you know, I always go to like Exodus 18. Moses, his father-in-law Jethro comes, says, you know, this is crazy. You can't lead this many people like this. You need leaders of tens, fifties, hundreds, thousands. That That's a leadership pipeline. You know, the, the person who's leading themselves is, so, is the first. And then somebody's leading 10, somebody's leading 50, somebody's leading hundreds. Um, that is a leadership pipeline. And, and, you know, they probably even had terms, you know, for some of that. And, and of course, that's true in a lots of organizations nowadays and certainly true in I don't know, the military, like this stuff exists everywhere. It wasn't always called a leadership pipeline. I even point to it though, like in the New Testament, Acts chapter six, again, the pipeline was not nearly as long, but when they commission the seven and it's like they, because there's not enough care for widows and the poor happening Mm -hmm. because, well, they're doing that and that's a huge need, but there's not enough preaching and and praying and spreading the gospel by the apostles. They need help. They basically, they add a level to their pipeline which I know this, mm-hmm. some people might think the way I'm talking about this is very non-biblical, <laughs> but because, you know, the Bible doesn't use these words, but they hand off, they delegate ministry to, to these men that was their, they were, it was also their responsibility, but just like a church leader, it wasn't their most important job. Their most important job. It was an important job, a very important job, but it was not their most important job. And so they handed off and essentially created like a new level. You know, like now we have commissioned these people. And I just love, like after that, the verse, the word of God spread. And the number of mm-hmm. priests were being added to the faith daily. Um, there's a connection between giving ministry away and the spread of the gospel and the growth of, of the church. That shouldn't be a surprise, right? Because if I just keep it all to myself, well, yeah, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. So a pipeline to me is you just decide, how do we want to structure it? Like in our church, uh, the first level is you're a volunteer or you're a, you're a member of a group. So if you're in an adult small group and you're just a member of the group, that's you. If you're a volunteer, but you don't lead anybody else, you lead yourself. Like, let's say I uh, work, I'm on the check-in team for children's ministry, or I am on the greeting team for student ministry, or I run tech for the student ministry large group. Like that would be a volunteer on the pipeline in our church. The next level is leader. You lead a specific group of people. And so you lead a small group of second grade kids. You lead a small group of 10th grade girls. You lead a team. You lead all of the uh, large group tech people, right? Like that would be an example. Mm -hmm. If we go to other ministries, like you lead the ushers that, you know, in the service and the main service. Um, And then in our world, we use coach as the next level. So a Mm -hmm. coach leads a team of leaders. Now that, again, that looks different. Like in elementary ministry, it might be, I lead all of the uh, first through third grade small group leaders at this service. Like that's my job. And they lead the kids. Uh, and then in student ministry, same thing. Like I lead all of the high school guys, small group leaders like that. I'm the high school small group coach. That's my role. Um, you know, in a band, it could be like, I lead two of the band leaders mm. that lead two of the bands, you know, and, and you probably are like more of a producer. So, and I don't want people to get too caught up in like this, cause you can kind of make it whatever fits your ministry. But the sure. idea is it's a structure of leadership. I lead this group of people who leads that group of people, because if you have more than eight volunteers, you probably need to start handing off some leadership because to mm-hmm. get to 20, like you can do it. There was a time when our children's ministry had 60 volunteers that all reported to me and it was awful <laughs> for them, you know, because I'm not that good of a leader. You know what I mean? So they weren't being that well cared for. It was like Moses, just like smaller scale, like they weren't being that well cared for. I didn't know them all as well that, you know, all that, the, you know, the relationship, the connection there, the moment I got in some other leaders and handed off some of that. Now I kind of skipped a step because at the time I ended up having three directors that led three different areas, preschool, elementary, and this family experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, they kind of like, they were like that next level director for us is that next level you lead in a bunch of coaches at that point. You're almost like staff, you know, in a sense, you're kind of like unpaid staff and they were, and that worked. And then not, but it was funny because even like a year or two later, 
we had to get coaches in because it was already past their point. They were all both all leading 20 to 30 people. It's like, okay, we're back. You know, this problem's here again. So I think the pipeline is about that, the structure of it. It's kind of like the base of what your volunteer org chart would look like. But then the other part is developing people through it. I mean, like if you have one and you know it's defined, like kind of the next level of it would be, here's how we help a volunteer become a leader. Here are the three things you need to do and read and watch to be, go from being a leader to be a coach. You know, here, here are the 10 things, you know, you need to do to go from being a, a coach to a director and be intentional about developing leaders is what will help you build out this leadership pipeline. Because the harsh reality is those kinds of leaders that make great coaches, great directors usually don't just show up and they're ready to go. <laughs> you know, they're not, Hey, I mean, they're there and sometimes they're leading in their own life. You know, they're a stay at home mom that homeschools their four kids. And like, that would be better than the vast majority of coaches you're ever going to find. So she's doing it um, already, but still there's needs to be training for like, what does that look like here? You know, what's our culture or the, the lady that's the CEO of her company. It's like, you're leading better than probably everybody in our whole church. But, but, but what does that look like here? Oh, let's read these books together. Let's 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 do this together. So, uh, I think those two things are helpful: for leadership pipeline structure for your team, how to give away some of that leadership, but then also how to develop people through it so they get better. You know, they become yeah. a better leader because of serving with you. Yeah, that's great, and I I love. I think what you're saying as well is that that needs to be customized uh, to whatever your church setting as well. I mean, <laughs> there's probably some people that are going, wow, I wish I had 60 volunteers that was overwhelming me. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, at yeah. the same time, even if you have two or three, like there needs to be some sort of pipeline where you're developing them and and hoping for the growth that will that God will bless over time. But you can do that even in a small church, small ministry kind of uh, situation. You don't have to wait until you're you're part of a, a mega church to have that kind of a pipeline set up. No, and the funny thing, I've seen people try to overdo it. Like all of a sudden, they got a leadership pipeline. It's got eight levels, and I'm like, mm, I don't think you need that. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. Um, I think of like our friends at Life Church. You know, I don't know how big Life Church is now, but at one point they were probably seventy thousand, and average attendance across all 20, 30 campuses. I don't yeah. even know; it's crazy. Um, even with now, of course, part of that's because it's a bunch of campuses, so it's not seventy thousand people in one location. But if you picture, it's the number is a, like you can use ten people as a rough number. It's kind of like in the Bible again, where mm -hmm. Moses had leaders of tens, but they did have fifties, so and hundreds and thousands. Well, so if a volunteer is if there's a leader who's leading 10 volunteers and that coach is leading 10 of those volunteers and then a director's leading the coach, you're already at a church of like a hundred thousand or whatever, just doing 10 times, 10 times, 10, you know? Yep. So I would say don't overdo it. And if you are a church that if your ministry, if you're leading six volunteers, I'd, I would already be thinking about which of one of these six could mm -hmm. be the leader to take something, whatever makes the most sense, middle school, high school, large group, small group, trips and events like what can i give them and then i just think there's a connection between the growth and that giving away so yeah. i think the sooner you do that even if you're doing it before you need it see i needed it like i was like underwater but even if you do that before you need it and i know this because we've watched our church plants do this um a lot of times that's what helps you actually get there you know our my one of my friends and mentors jim weidman says if you act i think he learned this phrase from somebody else but if you act big before you're big you'll grow big and it's not magic. It's not a guarantee for sure. But there is truth to that. Like if you start giving empowering that one leader of your six, it won't be long before you've got 13 and now they've got, they're leading six or seven and you're leading the other six or seven. Um, or even better, you're leading two people when they're each leading five or six. You know what I mean? Like now we're talking, you're building that yeah. from the ground up and take, and really practically what's great about it is you are giving ministry away to them. Mm -hmm and leadership and authority and decision-making, which frees up time for you to continue to build elsewhere. Yeah. That's the, that's the best part. That's huge. And I really like what, what that really boils down to is, is that empowerment piece. And of course this podcast is focused a lot on student ministry, um, which means that I absolutely loved that you had a whole section in your book focused on getting students involved and empowering them within serving as well. So again, we could spend an entire podcast talking about this, but what is one way that we can set up students for success when it comes to them volunteering? I would say train them 
separately, uniquely, whatever word might might fit there. I don't know. I'm trying in my head. I'm ranking like what would be if there was the one yeah. way. Like if I had to pick, was the one way. Actually, I might. I might have to retract. I might. Let me say another one. I'm kind of cheating. I'm giving you two ways. That's right. Um, and some of this is just personal experience. I am very passionate about student serving. Uh, it's part of my journey. It's part of so many people's journey. Um, I still to this day, I, I want our student percentage serving to outweigh the church percentage serving. Like, you know, like that's a goal of mine. And of course I'm very biased obviously as an ex-gen pastor, but, um, and my general goal is I want half of our average attendance of students serving in roles. Um, you know, so if your church had 30 students attending on average, hopefully you can get 15 of them serving. Um, and I've seen churches do way better than that. You know, I've seen churches do less than that. But the other thing, I mean, as I was kind of like thinking, ah, maybe that's not the most important thing as someone who also leads kids ministry. I do know that another important part of this whole thing is that like the entire staff has to be trained and volunteers more than staff have to be trained that this is a value for us because let's face it, a a sixth grader leading in preschool is not going to be the same as that adult leading in preschool. So we need to be okay that they're going to need more help, that they're going to face some challenges. I've, I've lost adult volunteer leaders because of having student volunteers in the room that were not doing well. And part of me is like, okay, we need to make sure that there's a level of expectation here for students. We can't just, it's, you don't just get to serve no matter what, as my pastor would say, serving is a privilege. However, I do expect adult volunteers to help student volunteers yeah. do better and learn and train. And if you're not up for that, let me show you the door, which sounds terrible, but like, like that's my approach. And so I think maybe the one way to set them up for success is to kind of build this culture that this is what we do. We, when you volunteer in kids or in guest services or in worship uh, or whatever, you don't just volunteer in your role. You also, even if you're not the leader of that group, you also help mentor student volunteers. And we've kind of got there and we were there as a church. I think it's been great. And I just love, we have students serving every ministry. I'm pretty sure. Um, every ministry, you know, which is just really cool. My dream that it still haven't happened yet. We've had lots of students that lead small groups. So that's always awesome when you got like a kid that was, you know, in a small group in elementary and fourth, fifth grade, got baptized by that leader in fifth grade. Now is leading with that leader as a 10th grader leading fourth graders like that is, I just love that. Um, What we have not had yet is still my goal is a student volunteer. That's a coach, Mm. you know, that leads, leads a team of leaders, like basically a, you know, 16 year old leading a group of like adults and students. Yeah. And I know we could do it. I know we could do it, you know? Yeah. And so I, I'm excited about that. I, I, the other, I do think the unique training thing is a thing too. Um, and some of that's just practical. It's like the average sixth grader isn't going to be as great with preschoolers right. as like a 28 year old would, even if that 20 year old isn't a parent themselves, there's just like natural things you learn, right. You know, that yeah. you just know, have you picked up as an adult that you may or may not know as a middle schooler. And th- now on the tech side, they might, they give you extra training maybe sometimes, you know what I mean? So it just depends But unique training for them, unique celebration with them. I think just builds that culture that this matters here and you want to be a part of it. Yeah. Well, I think I'm going to, I'm going to take away your cheat because what I, what I hear in both of those is intentionality. Like you have to be incredibly intentional, whether that be those, that extra, um, you know, attention that you're, you're spending with that, that student and helping them to understand their role a little more because maybe they're not as mature as some of the adults. Um, but then also intentionality within the whole church. Hey, we want to develop a culture of getting our next generation into serving and being a part of the church, contributing and all those sort of things. So it's, it takes a lot of intentionality. It does. You're right. That's a good way to phrase it. And we'd mess that up, which is why I lost that one volunteer that one time in preschool. Cause she got frustrated because, and, and it was one of those things where it was like, part of that was on us. We weren't intentional uh, about the training, about the clarity of what we're expecting from you. Part of that was probably on her. You know, she just didn't want that. If she was going to volunteer in in that area of our preschool, she didn't want to have to deal with middle school and high school. And that's where for me, it's like, okay, then you're not serving in here. <laughs> you know, now, So it's like, yeah. I need to own the fact that we messed up and we didn't set this up well. And the fact that that middle schooler probably wasn't doing a good job in there and all that. But like, Sure. I'm also going to be fine with the fact that in the future, if you choose that, that's, that's fine. That is 100% yeah. fine. Like yeah. I am so committed to student serving that I will go to great lengths mm-hmm. uh, to make that happen. My, me and my preschool director have argued many a times about <laughs> what can the ratios and balance be of students in preschool. Cause you know, she'll get a lot more than that. She'll get adults, you know, and, it, yep. and it, you can't, you can't just have it 
outnumbered, you know, like four students to one adult <laughs> or whatever. But like, yeah. I push it as far as I can push it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, before we, we wrap up today, I'd love to give you just an opportunity to encourage our listeners. Uh, maybe some of them have been struggling in this area, trying to find the right volunteers, or maybe even they're a volunteer themselves. And so how would you encourage our listeners that are, uh, that are listening along today? Yeah, I would say if you're struggling with volunteers, especially as a staff person, or if you're like a volunteer leader that's leading this area as a volunteer, you're like everybody else. I mean, so I don't know if that's encouraging, but to me, it's it's a reminder of like, okay, I'm not in this alone. I'm not weird. I'm not a bad leader. I'm not messed up. You know, like, it's like, this is everybody. You know what I mean? Like, I remember one time being in a breakout at a conference where it wasn't even about volunteers, but they were taking some questions and this guy raised his hand. And he's like, I actually have too many volunteers. And it was hilarious. <laughs> like the people that looked at him with like this death stare of like, shut up, shut yeah. up. Um, <laughs> which, and and I, 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 that's not unrealistic. That can happen, you know, from time yeah. to time, but it's obviously so rare. And everybody in the room is like, oh my gosh, who is this guy? We, yeah. we don't need to spend time here. Um, every, because everybody else is in this boat. But I do think there's a big difference between like we're 90 percent there and we're 60 percent there like mm -hmm. that. There's a huge difference there. So and my encouragement is you can do it. You absolutely can do it. You will have to face some rejection. You will have to commit the time. It does not happen by accident. You should use a plan, you know, so that you can track things through it. And so it's going to be hard, but it's not impossible. And you can absolutely do it. And if you do and if you work at it, it's not if you build it, they will come perfectly. But man, there's a just strong correlation between putting the work in, being intentional about the time and the effort, using the process we talk, I talk about in the book or any other process, and the results. There's a, there is a direct correlation there. Um, pray for workers and do the work as well. You know, just, 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 just pray. Don't just do the work. Pray to the Lord of the harvest and do this kind of work. And you can build the kind of healthy volunteer culture you've always wanted, or maybe you had at one point, but then something, you know, has changed in that. And then you'll have more freedom to work on other things. And it's like, I mean, it's just a different reality when you have built that. And then what that does for you and what the time that you can spend, even margin. I mean, gosh, ministry leaders, you know, we just, we just push the, the envelope too far. And this, this can help with that, with the margin, with the leadership, with the quality of the ministry, with the effectiveness. And it is hard, but man, is it worth it? Is it totally worth it? And you'll, the thing, this doesn't feel like encouragement, but I always say, I don't I always want to be, I'm a realistic person. Like I never want to paint something that's not true. You probably will have to work even harder for a few months to get this going, but then you'll reap those benefits forever. You know, yeah. once you get that going, you get it into what I would call like maintenance mode. Now you're at the place where, okay, I have more margin. I can work on this project I've been wanting to work on and, and everybody can do this. I, I think there's like a sense where maybe it's like a mystery or it's like unachievable. And, and that's not true. Everybody, yeah. everybody can do this. You're the, you're the right leader for the job. Mm. And, and hopefully this book will help and anything else, this podcast hopefully will help. Uh, you can do it. Absolutely. Yeah. And thanks so much for, for being on today, Nick. Um, after hearing some of the highlights, I know that people are going to, going to want to read the entire book. So how can they find the volunteer playbook, uh, your podcast and all the other things that you do online? How can they connect with you? Yeah. The, uh, you go to volunteerplaybook.com. It redirects to a page on my blog, which is just my name, nickblevins.com. And there you can link to different ways to get the book. There's, if you get the book, or even if you don't get the book, actually, uh, there's probably a way that you can get in there and get some of their free resources and things like that that go along with it, which would be helpful. And then Ministry Boost is something that we created to help church leaders, primarily kids and student pastors, and well, and anybody that leads in kids and student ministry. And that's ministryboost.org. We've got courses. This book was supposed to be a book that I started 10 years ago, became a course five years ago because that was quite frankly easier to create than a book. Mm -hmm. And that course has now turned into all kinds of other courses. Like really, I was talking about this with, um, with Kenny, my business partner today. The book, if you look at the book and the chapters, um, most of those chapters are other courses or like mm -hmm. these three chapters make a different course. And so it's kind of like volunteer playbook was like this big thing. And then we, with courses, we have narrowed it down. Like that's about recruiting and that's about um, onboarding and that's about training and so if, if you like that method more than reading a book, uh, Ministry Boost might be able to help. And we do coaching as well, too. But all that can be found, ministryboost.org, volunteerplaybook.com. And you can find my socials on there, too. 
I'd love cool. to connect. I'd love to hear if people get it. Like, how's it helping? What could be different? Did the structure work for you? I mm-hmm. wrestle with all that stuff. I want it to be helpful. My hope is, the whole, from the beginning, the hope was let's write a book because it's very accessible, right? Compared to a course that would cost more money or whatever, and uh, give it to so many church leaders so that their volunteer reality could be different. It could be a great volunteer culture that they love and and a job that they love. That's awesome. And yeah, so thankful for that. Um, I know as I was, as I was reading through it, man, man, this would have benefited me early in my ministry so much. (laughs) Like if I, if this was just all laid out. So I'm, I'm really excited for, for the new leaders that are going to be able to get their hands on this and and they're early in their ministry and hopefully um, (laughs) help them in a lot of areas that that those of us that did not have that when we started in ministry might've failed or fell short. um, And we learned along the way, Um, but this could be, be a huge help for, especially those that are just starting out, I think too. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was like, I feel like I aggregated a lot of stuff I learned from other people over the years. Like I don't very few, very little of what's in the book is original with me. It's just, you know, it's like you, I wish I had it back then. You know, it took me 20 years to gather it all together, but that's yeah. my hope is now it's in a book where, you know, you don't have to take 20 years yeah, <laughs> to, get, sure. to get it. <laughs> well, thanks again, Nick, for being on the podcast. Thanks for your leadership, your friendship, and may God bless all your work uh, on this book and continue to bless your ministry. Thanks, Steve, for what you do as well. Your podcast, your new work, helping youth leaders everywhere. Love it. Happy for you. Proud of you. Thanks for having me on. And thanks to all of you. If you enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please be sure to share it with someone else who you think would also enjoy it. This really does help us to continue to put out great content for you and have amazing guests on like Nick. You can find a link to purchase Nick's book in the show notes, but if you would like a chance to win a free digital or physical copy of the volunteer playbook, Nick has been gracious to give us five copies to give away. To enter, you just need to follow the link also in the show notes, which we will also be posting on our social media. At that link, you're going to find several different ways to enter, so don't just stop at one. For each method, you'll get more entries into the giveaway. So if you follow us on Twitter, subscribe to the podcast, visit our Instagram, and sign up for the newsletter, you'll actually get multiple entries into the contest. There's also a button to get a daily bonus entry. So if you sign up right away, you'll have more time to gain extra entries each day. We'll be running this contest until May 2nd, 2023. And just note that only U.S. residents will have the option for the physical copy. If you live outside the U.S., you'll automatically get the digital copy simply due to the international shipping cost. Also, at the time that this episode gets published, the Orange Conference 2023 is right around the corner. If you're going, I would love to meet you there. And if you don't see me walking around, please feel free to reach out to me on social media and I will do my best to find you. I'll also be at the National Network of Youth Ministries booth quite a bit during the event, so you should be able to find me there. And for all those who want to attend but have not bought your tickets yet, you could still use the code STEVE10, that's S-T-E-V-E-1-0, at checkout to save 10% off your tickets. And that applies to both single and group tickets, and you can also use the same discount code for in-person or online tickets. And when you do that, you're also supporting Student Ministry Connection. And speaking of discounts, be sure to head over to our sponsor's website, gshades.org, and use that promo code CONNECTION to save $20 off your order. They also have a great blog over there that you should definitely check out. We're going to be back in a couple weeks with our next episode, but until then, be sure to stay connected and may God bless your ministry.